So I've been, so I've been in clinical practice in the Northeast 20 years as a consultant. Uh, before that as a trainee, so I've had 28 years up here. And I've got quite a, a long history of surgery for localized advanced renal cancer. My presentation will be very clinical, aimed uh, at the trainees, and uh, I hope that uh, it will be informative for you. Um, so UK, we, we've already heard 3% of adult malignancies, renal cancer. In the UK, about 13,000 cases, and sadly, 4,500 4 deaths. That's CRC UK data, 2017. And I'd like to remind everybody that it, not, all, not all patients present with small renal masses on ultrasound. There's still around about a third of our kidney patients will be with stage two and stage three disease, late presentations coming through the hematuria clinic. So there's still a fair amount of locally advanced and unfortunately metastatic disease at presentation. My talk is on locally advanced. So as Dr. Kuska pointed out, and she was doing the, the earlier stage, this is really for me, it's T2B, T3 uh, disease, uh, non-metastatic. So Axel will be looking at the uh, cytoreductive and metastatic. This is non-metastatic locally advanced. This is the uh, thrust of my talk. And there are still open operations that need to be done. It looks gruesome, but for some patients, you need access for big surgery. I have several robotic colleagues. This is uh, Naeem Sumer in the next door theatre. We do a lot of prostatectomies, partial nephrectomies, nephrite redirectomies. But at the moment, no one's knocking on my door trying to take my practice. So I think I'm safe for a little bit longer uh, for the majority of these uh, locally advanced cases. Of course, there are many, many different approaches, and for certainly for T2B tumors, uh, laparoscopic, robotic, open. Uh, my message to your trainees out there would be to know your limits. Um, operating time, how are you going to extract, what are your conversions rates, what are your margin rates? So whatever you do, do it well. And there will be a gray area in the middle, particularly in those T2B type tumors, uh, as to what is the preferred surgical approach. This patient, for example, had a very large lower pole tumor, T2B, which was successfully resected laparoscopically. This patient had a large right renal tumor. It was high towards the upper pole. It was difficult to separate from the liver. The patient also had some impacted gallstones and a porcelain gallbladder. This was quite a difficult open procedure. So a lot of planning and thought needs to go on before you uh, consent these patients and advise them as to what is the, the safest and best approach for that individual patient. It certainly is, is very possible to get good outcomes from minimally invasive surgery. And this series from Scotland, predominantly T3A tumors, uh, reported by Grant Stewart in the BJUI, um, had good outcomes from laparoscopic surgery, but they, this is highly selected cases. And some T2B type tumors, for example, this patient with a large tumor, there's just no room. Uh, getting, getting a space on the pedicle uh, mobilizing the duodenum, getting towards the upper pole to get safe resection and good control. Sometimes there's simply no real room, particularly in the upper pole tumors, uh, for a safe, minimally invasive approach, in my opinion. You need to have some additional skills uh, for these type of locally advanced tumors, particularly on the right side, liver mobilization to gain access to the vena cava, the retrohepatic vena cava. And on the left side, you need to be able to mobilize the spleen and the pancreas. It's essential in these larger upper pole tumors in particular to be able to get good safe access to the upper pole and to be able to control the cava adequately. So that's a skill you need to learn if you're performing open surgery for these locally advanced tumors. Here's a patient that's had a Mercedes incision. There's a Thompson on the tract here with retraction, and the liver has been flipped over so that you can get good access to the vena cava and come down from above to control the adrenal and clamp the cava safely as required. In terms of incisions, there are a number of incisions that we use extended subcostal with a chevron type incision. Mercedes incisions are very useful and probably are the one we most commonly use for our high cable work. Um, a Lexus type incision where we just use a part of, or a hemi merc is, is the other name for it, would be the other incision. But a Mercedes gives you fantastic exposure 
for a complex cable work with the ability to mobilize the liver safely and the pancreas and the spleen. This is a patient that's had a Mercedes type incision. Here's the Thompson retractor in place, which gives you really good retraction. The liver has been flipped over. Here's where a tumor was cleared from the diaphragm. And in this case, a, a cable graft has been put in. We tend to put the on the track round the other way and the retractor blades from the on the track will go on to the Thompson system so that you have really good exposure for these locally advanced tumors with cable work so they can be carried out safely. Other bits of equipment, I like the Hemalox, I like the bipolar Aquamantis electrode. I particularly like the powered vascular staplers, which are very useful for stapling the cable if we're going to do a cable excision, and the ligar clips and the small ligar clips for little lumbar vessels are very useful. So a kit that I like. In terms of T3 disease, um, you'll remember the stage T3A with the renal vein is involved, T3B extending to the cava, and T3C when the thrombus is going above the level of the diaphragm. Very important to thoroughly investigate and work up these patients so you know exactly the level of the thrombus so you can plan surgery. And you can further classify the thrombus in terms of the level one, two, three, and four. These level one and two are more amenable to the small number of cases that have been carried out robotically. When we get to three and four, so four would be going into the atrium and three around about the hepatic veins. But I don't think, in my view, there is any role for minimally invasive surgery in these cases um, for reasons I'll come on to shortly. But I think you need to, to think about your thrombus level in terms of these the category one, two, three, and four, so that you can discuss and report literature. Here's a patient that had a left-sided renal tumor with cable thrombus extending up to the level of the cava. Here's the kidney fully mobilized. The, the, the vein has been skeletonized, and this was then stapled off. T3A disease. Here's a patient with T3B disease. You can see cable thrombus. You can see the level of the thrombus extending right up to the diaphragm, possible involvement of hepatic veins. This is the patient uh, seeing the kidney lying here. Here's the vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the left renal vein. So with, with vessels controlling the vena cava above and below the thrombus, and the left renal vein control with the vessel loop, a cavotomy can then be carried out to remove thrombus and tumor. Here's the vena cava oversown with 3 proline. Here's a hemolock clip, another one behind it on the renal artery. And here's the specimen with the thrombus that was lying within the cava. When there's no invasion of the IVC and if there's no lymphadenopathy and no evidence of metastatic disease, the prognosis for these patients can be quite good with up to 60 to 70 percent five-year survival. These are the sort of cases that we're seeing small number series reported in the literature for uh, a robotic approach. The same principles apply and I think with the ability to staple the cava uh, safely using minimally invasive techniques, this perhaps is, is, the, is the way forward for selected cases um, the ability to staple the cava reduces the risk of getting air embolism. The higher thrombus level cases, I don't believe will be suitable for robotic surgery, but some of my robotic colleagues may take a different view. And here's the staplers in action using a robotic technique, which I think simplifies the robotic surgery. Um, and we use a similar technique in selected open cases. Imaging is really critical to the workup and selection of patients to exclude metastatic disease, to look at the level of thrombus, to try and distinguish bland thrombus from tumor thrombus, and really important to try and look for IVC wall invasion, because if there's invasion of the IVC, it's a more difficult operation in terms of the need to resect or to graft, and also the prognosis is considerably worse. Here's a patient with IVC thrombus on MR scan. 
you can see thrombus from a left renal tumor extending. Here's bland thrombus below. This is non-enhancing. This is not tumor thrombus. And in this situation, you could reasonably evacuate or staple off the IVC above a level of bland thrombus. There's also some enhancement of the IVC wall, very strongly suggestive of IVC invasion. There is some literature emerging to suggest that multi-parametric MRI can help to predict IVC wall invasion. And I would like to have an MR scan on all these IVC patients, thrombus patients, to try and help predict so I can know the level, I can know the possibility of invasion, and I can know whether we're more likely to have to do a graph. The literature would suggest that if you have an IVC diameter of greater than 34 millimeters, you're more likely to have invasions of IVC. If you have extra luminal tumor signal, more likely to have invasion. And if you have to resect the cava with greater than 50% reduction in the diameter of the cava, uh, a graft may be beneficial to reduce the risk of stenosis and subsequent thrombosis. So the, the, the decisions to graft or to resect, when, when, when is resection of the IVC a good option? Well, in the presence of chronic obstruction with collaterals, if it's below the level of hepatic veins, if you have invasion, maybe to secure bland thrombus uh, and to get better margin rates. Grafts can be undertaken, usually a, a Dacron graft. Certainly if it's an acute obstruction without collaterals, you may have more problem with lower limb edema, so we might be more inclined to place a graft, but you will have to anticoagulate those patients and a lot of those grafts will thrombose. If you place a graft, there's also the opportunity to reimplant the contralateral renal vein. Now, what about patients that have tumor thrombus extending above the level of the diaphragm to the atrium, such as we have here? These patients will require deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Venous bypass is an option for patients that have high thrombus below the diaphragm, but not for patients where tumor extends above the level of the diaphragm. If there's thrombus above the diaphragm, then circulatory arrest is, is the only way you're going to be able to perform a, a, a resection. Patients put on bypass with the cannula to the aorta are returning to the right atrium. And here's a patient with the bypass uh, cannulae in place to the aorta coming back to the atrium. You can see the stenotomy is here. It's a Mercedes below the incision. The liver is flipped and the nephrectomy has been completed. The principles, so we would start usually with a stenotomy so that we've got the ability to move to bypass quickly if thrombus becomes dislodged. Following the stenotomy, we mobilize the kidney before the patient is anticoagulated. Once the patient is anticoagulated and cooled, we go to bypass, cooling the patient to 18 degrees. You should aim for an arrest time for less than 30 minutes, shorter the better, but certainly no more than 30 minutes. Um, and then after the nephrectomy and thrombectomy is performed, the patient is warmed. And this takes approximately an hour for the warming. It often takes up to an hour for the cooling. So it's a sort of procedure that can take you most of the day. There are risks with circulatory arrest with approximately 5% risk of myocardial infarct, CVA, some form of confusion or memory loss and ongoing hemorrhage. But with the circulatory arrest, the, 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 the hemorrhage can be controlled as it feeds back into the bypass machine. Is it worth it, the, is surgery worth it for these patients with locally advanced disease? Well, the results can be, be rewarding. So even with T3 disease, 59, 60%, five years survival. We reported our own data in 2013, and we had 63% survival at five years across the board with our cable, cable thrombus cases. For those patients that had cytoreductive nephrectomy in this setting, none of our patients were alive at five years. And I've included the reference on the slide there, um, if, if anyone wants to go through that. What about the thrombectomy cases under circulatory arrest? Still very worthwhile. This is our own data with 31% five-year survival. But you do get complications, 33% for the length of stay of 11 days. So again, Patients need to be worked up very carefully and counseled regarding um, the risks that are involved. 
And remember, surgery for these non-metastatic groups uh, is really still the only option. The SOURCE trial showed no, de no benefit from adjuvant therapy um, with serafinib in that MRC study. So we don't send patients on for adjuvant therapy. They afterwards, these patients will go on to close surveillance with CT follow-up. So in terms of this, this patient group, um, selection really is key. You need current, up-to-date, accurate, complete staging. You need to know your thrombus level, particularly when you're getting into that, le that level three thrombus. Where is the thrombus in relation to the hepatic veins? Where am I going to be putting my clamp? Is there invasion of the IVC? Counsel the patients. You need to have a regular team that you work with. So there are a lot of people involved during surgery, um, big incisions, a lot of equipment. You want to work with the same team week in, week out. Adequate exposure is critical to perform surgery safely. Um, renal artery, there is some, some data on embolizing the, the renal artery prior to surgery. We, we don't subscribe to that. Um, but we do subscribe to early ligation of the renal artery during surgery. And always be prepared for an IVC resection and graft. Usually you can predict it from your imaging, but if you cannot, you've got to have things available. Um, so, so for us, that would be equine pericardium for a graft or staples to take uh, to, to for, for a resection. But be prepared for everything. I think... Uh, Whatever technique you use, perhaps we need a trifecta for our locally advanced cases. We need acceptable resection margins, low levels of major complications, and a, and a, sh a shorter hospital stay and quicker recovery as possible, whatever means you use to achieve that. I think in years to come, there'll still be a role for a few dinosaurs like me. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. <laughs>